like how spark works can you quickly guide me spark architecture what happens is first whenever we write a spark application it gets uh, the driver program gets uh, executed and uh, it will try to first make sure if the based on the schema catalog the uh, you know transform the, the the code that we have written is syntactically correct or not once it is validated it is uh, going it will be creating an unresolved logical plan so uh in this unresolved logical plan it will be actually having all the various uh, plans based on cost and role based and then it will go ahead and create logical plan you with the help of catalyst optimizer and uh, finally a physical plan will be created uh, which will then be uh, you know used What is the unique feature which we get with the Spark session, right? Which we yeah. earlier, like those who have like good experience in Spark programming, we used to create the multiple context, right? So, yes, what sir. is the unique feature which we get with the Spark session? So, Spark session is like a number of la under it um, under the hood there are uh, multiple contexts available, Hive context and uh, Spark context. and uh, all this context will sit under this umbrella called as a spark session Excellent. so yeah when we create a spark session we can unit, use it like a um, spark session dot uh, spark context and we can declare it like a text file or whatever the file we want to write if it is an hive we are using spark session dot hive context we can declare it you know we don't use like map reduce nowadays right so mm-hmm. why did we not use it and what were the drawbacks that spark solved so mm-hmm. that went forward and used spark and not use map reduce anymore so uh, actually the biggest problem that spark solved was uh, in memory computation so it uh, directly results in 10 to 100 times faster speed because uh, map reduce involves a lot of disk input outputs and uh, that just takes a lot of time and apart from that spark is actually really compatible with all the languages that we have so by spark uh, python sql java whatever we want to write we can write our code in it and whereas uh, map reduce was really sticky on java and stuff and uh, it was actually really complex to write all of this code the map and the reduce part and uh, also one of the things was that we had to think in this way of mapping and reducing every time we want to solve a particular problem whereas in spark we can directly think of it as a table and we can perform table like operations on uh, the data frames that we have so yeah map reduce it comes with a lot of gray areas like for example we cannot solve every single problem using map reduce like uh, there were a lot of uh, limitations to it but in spark we can actually do any type of calculation even complex calculation that we need why spark is lazy if i say i want to filter out the data if i am writing the code in 10 steps if i am filtering the data in the 10th step like before the last step if i am doing multiple shuffle operations if the spark doesn't lazy then all the data will be shuffled and it will be a uh, huge operation basically uh, so there is no optimizations happening here in this specific case uh, consider the case my spark is lazy so if my spark is lazy it will try to push the 10th step to the very early stages uh, so that uh, the data will be filtered and uh, the kind of um, data shuffling will be reduced and it is a bit of a uh, a uh, more optimized way so spark internally do says uh, like a filtration steps will be pushed up and uh, the cost taking steps like uh, the more intensive uh, like a uh, compute intensive steps will be pushed down so that's why we call it as an spark is lazy so when there is an action called at that time so all this process will actually start up you mentioned rdd right when you were talking about the so what do you think an rdd is so rdd stands for resilient distributed data set it is the basically fundamental data processing unit available in spark it is basically the lower level api present there so what we do in rdd is we basically specify how to do it rather than what we need to do and in this approach we basically forego the uh, benefit of catalyst optimization because spark doesn't get an idea of what we want to do uh, at the final output basically in rdd uh, we specify this set of actions that need to be done in tight accordance sequential do you know about uh, dag and uh, lineage yes please explain me the difference between these two dag is basically the final uh, execution plan which i said right it is a final execution plan on the basis of which our entire set of tasks set of transformation is being uh, done dag initially uh, shows the sequence of actions which takes place uh in different stages as well as the different dependencies among the uh, stages as well whereas the lineage graph shows the lineage of the uh, rddds like which rdd came from which rdd after doing certain set of transformation so i mean, this is the difference between uh, tag and uh, lineage
suppose you have uh, two light transformation okay and one action was called and probably you you are handling 2 gb of data mm. so how many jobs stayed and tasks will be created so two white transformation means uh, three stages mm-hmm. and uh, uh, one action means uh, one job and uh, we had uh, 2 gb of data so the default block size is 128 mb so we would have around uh, i think 16 partitions or 16 yeah, tasks yeah. yes do you know about uh, narrow uh, transformations and wide transformations so these are the two set of transformations that we have in spark narrow transformation or those transformations wherein the number of partitions before and after the transformations remain the same after going through the transformation as well few examples of them like um, filter map so if we have five partitions before this transformation once we do it the number of partitions remains same which is like five in this case and there is no shuffling or the exchange of data between the partition whereas in case of white transformations what happens is uh, we have an exchange of data among the partitions so a uh, few example of this like being grouped by join and uh, the number of white transformations define the number of stages that we have in our data you know the difference between repartition and coalesce repartition is where you know either increasing or decreasing the partitions where coalesce is purely meant for you know decreasing the partitions actually so the primary difference would be like there will be complete shuffle in terms of repartition where the data movement would be huge and where in coalesce there will not be any data movement it just tries to accommodate all the key columns and then it just reduces the partitions okay. so most of the mm-hmm. cases we had to deal with repartition but it comes at its cost but it will be like one or two times operation once it is set as the, the next thing if the data comes in the pipeline you know it will automatically go to those partitions i just allocate a couple of my executors or worker nodes so my partition size is going to be the same based on uh, my allocation of memory so how do i upscale or uh, descale it basically i want to increase the number of partitions or mm-hmm. decrease the number of partitions for know. increasing the number of partition we will use repartition dot repartition method because uh, it will do a shuffle by internal so that while in- increasing the partition we will be using repartition but for reducing the number of partition we should use coalesce because it will merge those data in a smaller number of partitions so it will not do reshuffling operation so, so it is less costly can i not reduce using the repartition we can reduce using repartition but it will unnecessarily do the shuffling so it is more expensive operation actually so like what is like with column where we use this api yeah with column is used whenever we want to create a new column for example we have the salary and we want to uh, also find out uh, the um, bonus that has been provided to each of these mm-hmm. uh, employees so maybe mm-hmm. we can say bonus is provided uh, based on 10% of the salary that is being given so we can create mm-hmm. a with column we can provide the column name as bonus and then we can call out the column in which we want to apply our logic so we have the salary column so we will write call salary and we will multiply it into 0.1 so it will actually give us the bonus column which will be having the amount uh, 10% of the salary amount suppose you have 1000 tb of data or maybe 1000 gb of data you are handling and uh, you want to configure your cluster such a way that you should perform in you know, optimal states so basically we wanted to understand what kind of cluster configuration and what kind of basic thumb rule you will apply when you are starting a cluster configuration what kind of executor you will even have number of executors based upon the size of data the partitions that we are going to take up and then kind of cpu cores and the memory that that we are going to use as part of clusters right so those things we'll have to take into consideration and uh, we'll have to ensure that the executors within each node right uh, they are uh, like uh, properly distributed so that we make full use of those resources so that it can efficiently handle parallel processing in it these are like few of the factors which i would consider 
So let's say I have 10 partitions, mm. okay? And I want to assign the number of CPU cores as well for that Spark job. So how are mm. you going to like, what is the number that you're going to give to this many CPU cores I need? It's basically related to how much fast you want to perform mm. your job, how critical that job is. If mm. that job is very critical and mm. uh, if I have 10 partitions, I will just assign the 10 cores for that uh, particular job. That is not self-critical and can have a little greater time according to the other job. We can assign, let's say, five cores for that mm. partition. Then it would take a double amount of time. If, if it at all is non-critical itself, we can just assign two cores, then it will take the five times. But only thing I'm trying to say is there is no point of assigning 13 cores to a 10 partition job because mm. whatever you do, no matter how how are the jobs configuration, three cores will always be unutilized because mm. 10 cores can only handle those 10 partitions. Right. It will not happen that 10 partitions also get divided into 13 cores and mm. get computerized. One core would be able to take one partition. So suppose you have 10,000 GB of data or 1,000 GB of data. How will we start the configuration? What will be the ideal number? Obviously, this is not a freak number, but you should have some number for the starting point. So what will be the ideal executor numbers? How will you calculate the executor memory? You can just explain the process. Basically, how we calculate the executors will depend upon the partition size, actually. Mm-hmm. So suppose in one of my projects, it is 128 MB, actually. For this 128 MB, I just divide the whole data and divided by 128 MB, whatever the partition is. I get the whole data how much can be it is then based on the course actually i have read this when you are creating executors there are two kind of strategies thin executor and fat executor when i have read about both of them then i have found like if your number of cpu cores are more than five you will see some hdfs throughput sum so the best possible way i want to start is like executor with five cores actually so based on this i will see the cluster configuration so i start with executor core five based on that i will figure out how much maybe each executor do that mm-hmm. then based on that i will find the number of executors on that so what uh, is the difference between partitioning and bucketing? Uh, so partitioning is basically we physically divide the data that is being stored in mm-hmm. our data lake or any part. We physically divide the data and it is being stored in folders. Basically, we see it as folders. And whenever mm-hmm. we do a filter on that, we apply a filter condition on those columns on which it has been partitioned. Let's say we have a data and uh, there's a column called current date. And mm-hmm. if we do a partitioning and store that data based on the current date column in S3, we will see that there's a folder created inside that bucket called current date and inside that the data is stored. So we can see a physical representation in partitioning. But in bucketing, what happens is it's basically a logical representation in which the data is stored based on hashing or some function in which the data is logically stored. And whenever we do a query or something, so again, it applies that function. And when it hits the hash value, it pulls the data from that bucket. Basically, we predefine how many buckets the data has to be stored. But in partitioning, we can't do that part.